So in my living room, I have a painting, OK? And it's a picture of the, it's a painting of the nativity. It's a print, I should say, of, the, uh, of our, an artist's rendition of the nativity. And I keep it up all year round. And there's a couple of reasons why I have it, uh, the, why I bought it. The first is that I got it at a really good deal. So if money is a factor, I mean, I paid wholesale. And, uh, and I like, so, and the second reason I liked it, right? So I paid wholesale, I looked at it, I liked it. The third reason why I bought it is because it doesn't have a Bible verse on it. And, uh, and when I tell people that, they seem really shocked. I worked at a, at a Christian bookstore for about nine years, and we sold lots of prints. We had art all along the walls. And we would look at it, and someone would say, Derek, don't you just love, one of my coworkers would be like, don't you just love this one? And I'd say, I'd love it more if it didn't have a Bible verse on it. I would get this shock, you know, like, like as a Christian, I automatically have to like something if it has a Bible verse attached to it. The reason why I, I prefer pictures without Bible verses on them, paintings or photographs or something of that sort, is because they say that, um, a picture is worth a thousand words. Because when you look at a picture, depending on what you're going through, depending on, on what you're experiencing in life, the picture takes on a different meaning and a different interpretation every time you see it. And when I look at a picture, and I, you can see like mountains in the background and, and a beautiful ocean or um, a, a river or a lake in between. And then maybe some, uh, some trees with a path and some figure walking along that path. And, and you look at that, and I feel like I could just fall into it. And depending on my mood, but depending on what I'm going through, I could think, I th- I could think that that water could just make me feel like, like the Holy Spirit is just bringing peace into my life. Or I can look at, depending on what I'm going through, and just think those mountains are just magnifying the gloriousness of God. Or depending on what I'm going through, I can look and I can see this figure walking along the path, and I can look at that and I can say, Lord, I feel like that's me. Would you just come aside? And I feel like the moment you put a verse on it, you have someone else telling you exactly what you're supposed to think and exactly how you're supposed to feel. And so you've instantly neutered the potential that this picture has in your life. You know, art has a way of of just making you feel alive, whether we're talking about music, or whether we're talking about paintings, or whether we're talking about poetry. And the Bible says, or teaches us, that our God is an artist. Uh, He's a virtuoso. He's an exceptional artist. He's the greatest artist. The Bible teaches us in, in Isaiah, for example, that God is a potter. Right, who likes to craft things with his hands. The Bible teaches us that God is an architect. He went through great detail to, uh, to tell the Israelites um, what the tabernacle should look like, including what jewels and what rubies and what kind of uh, stones to use and when, and when to lay gold and where to put it. With such precision and such detail, and the book of Hebrews tells us that that tabernacle is merely a shadow of this glorious tabernacle that God himself created somewhere in the heavenlies. The Bible teaches us that God is a musician, that God is a lover of music, that he created instruments, and then he created beings, whether angelic or human, to to play those instruments, and and then God sits back and says, now play for me. And the Bible teaches us that God is a master painter, that he looked up and he went ahead and Hebrews says, by faith we believe that God made the universe. And you know, it's it's not a surprise to me, contrary to what you might hear in pop culture, the vast majority of scientists believe that a God exists. And it's not surprising because how could you look at your, take your technology today and look deep into space and not marvel at it? And I think my favorite of them all is, is a passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where the Bible says that, um, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. You know, and, and that God just looks at, he says, what am I, I going to do with this? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on a masterpiece. I'm going to make a Richard. I'm going to make a Natalie. I'm going to make a Dave. 
Now, God is, is an artist, brothers and sisters. And when I think about God sometimes, and when I think about some of the art he makes, whether we're talking about a masterpiece like you, or whether we're talking about the duckbill platypus, I think our God is an eccentric artist, right? Our God is that Frenchman who's got his hilt, hat tilted to the side and his arm is just going crazy on the mat. I think of God as maybe the eccentric scientist whose hair is all nappy and his bow ties off to the side while he's engrossed in what he's doing. I think of God as that, that philosopher whose, whose mouth can't keep up with the, the, the thoughts that are going through his, his, his mind all the time. You know, and I think about artists in this world. And I think every artist I know, every serious artist I've ever known or read about, they were driven by a cause. Because why else would you choose the lifestyle of an artist? Very few, the percentage of them that make it big time is very, very, very small. The vast majority of them are, are struggling just to, to get the tunes out so they can play uh, music in, in local venues, or are painting or on some street corners, or, st- or, or have painted themselves like the Statue of Liberty and are standing somewhere on a soapbox looking to connect with people. So what drives these people to do what they do? I remember when my wife and I were in Rome for our honeymoon and we were walking along the street at night and there was a street light over top. And, and there was this crowd gathered around. And so we wanted to see what was going on and so we kind of shouldered ourselves in. And there was this girl. And she looked, I don't know, 17, 18, maybe a little bit older. And she was there on her knees like this and she had paper scattered around. She had a mat. She had a, a, a bucket full of spray paint and some geometric shapes, blocks and stuff. And she would take them, and her hands were just going crazy. And she would put the, the blocks down and spray paint, grab a different paint, grab a different shape, and spray and paint. And, and then she would just, and we'd watch them, like, what is she doing? And then she would grab it and hold it up like this without looking up. And it would just be this gorgeous scenery that she painted, just with spray paint and geometric shapes. And she'd hold it up and put out money, or hold out her hand. And, and someone would take the, the print and put a bill in her hand, and without looking at Whatever it is she got, she'd, she'd put it in her pocket and move on to the next piece. What drives these people? And when I, when I think about an artist, I think these are people who are driven by a cause. They're driven by a passion. You know, and then I'll tell you, in most cases, they're not driven by the support of their family. I'll tell you that. Because the family will say, go out and get a real job, make a real living, live nine to five, bring in a steady income. But I can't help but think, brothers and sisters, that, that you and I can go out and get a real job. We can make a living. But I feel like it's the artists of this world who help us to feel alive. Because that's what music does. That's what painting does. And I think that that's why our God is an artist. Because he wants us to be alive. There's a city in um, Albania. Albania was, uh, was run by communists between World War, communism between World War II and 1990. And in that period, um, the city just, it, it, uh, the city is called Tir, uh, Tirana. And Tirana was the capital, or is the capital of Albania. And Tirana, because it was a communist country, it was a gray city. Or because Albania is a, was a communist country, it was a, it was a gray city. By that, I literally mean it was a gray city. The buildings were gray. The streets were gray. There was no color at all in the city. Then in 1990, when communism fell, um, a, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the leaders of the city were voted in through democracy. And, and corruption ensued in that city. 
through both corruption of the, of the political leaders and corruption through, um, through violence and chaos. And this continued on for about a decade. And there was, there was an artist, a man who taught art at the University of Albania. And, and he was writing about the corruption that was in his city. And then one day he shows up at his doorstep to go home and he's met by a couple of thugs. And they literally beat him to death. And he says that he's convinced that they were sent by the current reigning mayor of the, of the city. So he decided when he recovered to run for mayor. And in 2000, the year 2000, he won just by a little bit. He got in as mayor. And he faces a city that is dungy, that is filled with corruption from the police force to the political parties to the gangs. And everywhere you go in that city, people, have bar, people had bars up, right? The, the, in the, the stores, they would want to protect themselves. And it wasn't a safe place for anybody. And because the city had been so longly um, confined to communism, and this was way before the days of the internet, people weren't experiencing the outside world. And so there was just this closed, dark, dungy pit of the world, if you will. And this artist decided to apply his passion to see if he can turn the city around. And he found this big building in the city that was just run down and gray and, and crumbly. And he painted it bright, bright yellow. And he paid attention to detail. There was actually white trim around edges and borders. And he said when they were done the painting job, you would think that a celebrity had arrived in town. He said, because the whole town came out and people gathered around and, 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 the, and, and everyone just kind of stood in awe. And he said, there was a big traffic jam. Nobody could believe it. And he went ahead and he started painting other parts of the city. And I'm talking not painting like you see when you drive around Windsor. I'm talking bright greens, bright blues, bright white buildings with, with um, beautiful artwork painted and stripped along the side. He took his passion and he just began to pour it, his love of art, into the city. And when he did, they noticed that crime rate started plummeting. The city began to turn around. People began to take pride. He said he was walking along the street one day. And there was a shop owner who was taking the bars off of his window and, and doors and was replacing them with with blinds and curtains. And so he stops the shop owner. This is true. And he stops the shop owner and he says, why are you taking your, your bars down? What has changed? And the shop owner says, well, it's safer now. And he says, well, why is it safer? Do they, have they assigned more police officers to this community? And the shop owner smiles and says, no, 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 are you kidding? He, said, he says, it's beautiful. And when it's beautiful, it's safe. Brothers and sisters, God, God's plan, God's strategy is to re restore Eden. He wants to restore his canvas. God's city, if you will, has become gray. But God wants to paint it beautiful again. Because when it's beautiful, people get saved. God's creation gets restored. And God set about a plan to make things beautiful again. And just like the, the mayor, how he went ahead and started contracting people, because obviously he couldn't run around the city and do it himself, he entered relationships with people so that people would go and would help him beautify the city. God said about a plan through which he would cooperate with humans, or humans would cooperate with him. 
And he set about this plan by entering and engage a, a relationship with a guy named Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants. And God got this band together and said, Together, I'll be faithful on my part if you be faithful on yours. And together we're going to restore the project. Together we're going to make things beautiful again. But almost very similar to the people of, of Tiran uh, at that time, God's people too began to lose faithfulness. And at that time, it just seemed that as God's people lost, uh, stopped being faithful to the project, stopped being faithful to the plan, it put the whole project in jeopardy. And so God created a strategy. God created a strategy in which he turned around his painter's hat and rolled up his sleeves. And he came down. He said, I'm going to, get in. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into this project. By doing so, brothers and sisters, he was playing the part of God. He was playing God's role to be faithful, to see the project through to the end. But he was also playing your role and my role. Because he needed both parties to make it work. So he came down here and he played the role of you and I. He pulled out his paintbrush, if you will. He went up on that cross and he began to paint the canvas red. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, Paul writes this. He says, For in the gospel, I want you to understand when Paul says gospel, that is a shorthand way of saying, For in the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, for in the gospel, God's righteousness or the righteousness of God is revealed. He says, from faith for faith, as is written, the righteous will live by faith. I want to explain something to you guys about faith, if I can, just for a minute. In English, faith and faithfulness have two separate meanings completely. Like, like when you think of faith, you think, well, faith is, um, faith denotes, uh, and I looked this up, faith denotes um, a mindset. Like, I'm, I have faith that I will get the job. That's faith. Faithfulness devotes a, uh, denotes a character within a person that is, uh, that, is uh, that produces some sort of activity. I'm going to be faithful to my friend Richard. Okay, those are the two concepts. But in the biblical Greek, in the Greek language, and in the Hebrew language, those concepts are not separated. In fact, they're so intimately connected that you cannot separate them. Now, when you read the Bible and you read about faith, you need to understand faith in the terms of, in terms of being faithful. A mindset that produces a character that results in some sort of activity. I want to talk to you again about righteousness. The word righteousness in the New Testament, when applied to God, the righteousness of God, dikaios and theos, that phrase, Paul uses it to literally translate references in the Old Testament where it says that, that where it refers to the faithfulness of God to his promise to Abraham. Okay? With those two concepts in mind, I want to read Romans 1.17 again. It says this, for in the gospel, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's faithfulness to his promise to Abraham has been revealed. And it is from faithfulness to faithfulness. From faithfulness for faithfulness. Okay, and then it turns its attention to you and to me. And it says, for through faithfulness, through your faithfulness, God's plan to the promise to restore creation is being revealed. Okay? Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For God made him, being Jesus, who knew no sin at all, to become a sin offering for you and for me, 
so that we who are in him might become the faithfulness of God or might become the righteousness of God. In other words, if we live in him, then when we move about this life through faithfulness, we are literally showing the world God's faithfulness through Christ on the cross. I want you to understand the impact of that statement. God has called you, brothers and sisters, to embody the answers to the problems of the world. Being a Christian isn't about getting saved so I can get to heaven. God has called you and me to embody the answers to the problems of the world. I want to say it one more time because I really feel like the weight when I was going over the sermon. I had to say it to myself several times to let the weight of that sink in. Think about it today, brothers and sisters. God has called you to literally embody the, the, the answers to the problems of the world. Poverty. God has called you to embody the answers to that problem. What have you done about it? AIDS. God has called you and me to embody the answer to the problem of AIDS. Have we done anything about it? Prostitution. God has called you and me to embody the answer to that problem. Have we done anything about it? Abuse. God has called you and me to embody the answer to that problem. Have we done anything about it? Gluttony. Corporate gut gluttony. God has called you and me to embody the answer to that problem. You know what I find most interesting, brothers and sisters? You know what the real clincher for me is when I was thinking about this? It's that God trusts you to be faithful to that calling. And God trusts you to be faithful to that calling. I was watching a TED Talk. TED Talks are world-renowned um, talks by um, some of the fam- uh, best speakers uh, and experts in, a, in any particular field. And I was ta- watching a TED Talk done by a girl named Amanda Palmer. If you've never heard of Amanda Palmer, um, don't look her up because then you'll be mad at me for bringing her up in the sermon. She's, she's by far not a Christian, and she is uh, definitely um, a far outside-of-the-box kind of person. I found her TED Talk. Now, the TED Talk, though, was a serious talk. And I found her TED Talk very interesting. She is a musician, and she, uh, she was um, going around doing music and selling her music, and she, she was happy one day she got in a professional label. But she wanted out of that label. And so finally, when her label released her, she got this idea. She didn't want to expect or tell her fans to buy her music. Very out of the box idea. Because as a musician, you live off of the CDs and off the sale of your merchandise. And, and musicians have been protecting their content against internet, against Napster, against iTunes, against any other way that, 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 that their music might be stolen. And here this woman is, she wanted to turn that around. She said, I don't want to expect my fans to buy my music. Instead, she said, I'm going to give them my music and then ask them to support me. And so she ran a Kickstarter uh, campaign. Kickstarter is a website that allows people to, to, um, to raise money for whatever endeavor they're doing. And she said, the money I need to, to, to live for my band and for a certain period of time um, is, is $10,000. Or sorry, not ten. Sorry, it's a hundred thousand dollars. That was her, 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 her Kickstarter, and she went on there and she said, "You guys can have my music, but will you support me?" Now, her fans came out, and boy, did they ever support her. Not a hundred thousand dollars, somewhere around two, uh, one and a half million, she raised, and so. <laughs> 
to celebrate. She was in Germany, and when the Kickstarter had ended, to celebrate, she threw a party. And of course, the party was filled with strangers she didn't know. And there were all these people there, and most of them were, uh, I, I would guarantee, every one of them was drunk, and most of them were on drugs. And who knows what else was going on at this party. And she did something as crazy. She passed around markers to all these people that she didn't know. She passed around blue markers and green markers and yellow markers and red markers and whatever she could find. Forgive me, brothers and sisters. She stripped herself down naked. She extended her arms like this. And she let them draw on her. It's shocking. And as she describes the experience of letting these complete strangers who are drunk and on drugs and who knows what else draw on her, she says this. She says, this was a ninja master level fan connection. Because what I was really saying here was, I trust you this much. Should I? Show me. No matter what I want to say about this woman, and you can put that aside now, what I got from that, what impacted me, was that you and I, brothers and sisters, are the drunks. You and I are the, are the, are the people on drugs. You and I are the party animals in that room who are completely engrossed in sin and completely out of control. And one day, Christ stripped himself. And he placed a marker in every one of our hands. The master painter, the master musician, gets up there after stripping himself. And he extends his arms like this after he gives you a marker. He says, I trust you this much. He says, should I? Show me. Romans 1.17 says, For I am not ashamed of the naked death of Jesus Christ. For in it God showed himself to be faithful. And he has called us to be faithful. For in, faithful, for in his faithfulness we reveal God's faithfulness to his project. God has given you and me, brothers and sisters, a marker, a paintbrush. And he has invited us to paint the world with him today. I've long struggled with defining faith, and I've often tried to get down into the real technical nitty-gritty of it. I think if I'm to define faith today, I would say faith is this. Faith, brothers and sisters, is painting the world beautiful with God. Amen. <laughs>